Last month, we began a tribute to Disney artist Rolly Crump. In that first episode, we looked at his early days at the studio and then his first experiences at WED. He started as an entry-level animator, which is called an in-betweener, working on the shorts. After many months, he graduated to features Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, and then 101 Dalmatians. And then after spending months penciling the spots on an endless stack of Dalmatian drawings, he was transferred over to WED. Initially, he worked on a Wizard of Oz scene that was considered for an expansion of Storybook Land, and then he worked with illusionist Yale Gracie on The Haunted Mansion, which at that time was simply called The Haunted House. He was the youngest member of the WED team, a person who had been quickly moved from mid-level animation assignments to Walt's special crew. Some around him resented his youth and how quickly he had advanced, but Rowley saw it as an opportunity not only to learn more about art, but also to learn how the mind of Walt Disney worked. There was, um, there was a philosophy and once you got inside of Walt and he got inside of you philosophically from the standpoint of design, there was a form of communication that took place. And you didn't bastardize anything, you stayed with it. So today, we're going to continue his story. And again, up front, I'll mention that Rolly will occasionally use light swear words as we move through this episode. Simply, it's impossible for me to edit or bleep out these words and still have his discussion make sense. So I'm putting this warning up front in case you're listening with kids. As we left off, Rolly was telling stories about developing the haunted mansion. The mansion would take roughly a decade to design. It would have three main design phases. The first was with Ken Anderson in the late 1950s. The second was with Rolly and Yale Gracie. And the last was overseen mostly by Mark Davis and Claude Coates with input from Ex Atencio and others. Rowley's stories here are mostly focused on the early 1960s, that mid-period of design, when the haunted house was still a walkthrough, long before anyone thought of the mansion as a ride. So, if you're ready, here we go. For the mansion, they focused their efforts on the early rooms. One room was haunted by the ghost of a sea captain and his wife, a scene with disturbing special effects. This entire sequence had been mocked up on a soundstage, but the story of the captain who killed his wife couldn't occupy the entire experience. There needed to be other stories. To get ideas, Rolly and Yale watched horror movies. At least one time they watched a horror movie with Walt himself. The two of them considered stage illusions. They they read books. As this attraction would be a walkthrough, they figured that a host, a Disneyland employee most likely, would need to appear early on in the experience to guide guests through it. Yale and I actually did develop that when you were in the, the first room, there was a, an elevated hallway. And if you look down the hallway, all of a sudden an ectoplasmic thing would begin to appear. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there would be a person appear, a real person. And the person would come forward and there was a gate and the gate would swing out and that became the ghost host. And the reason that there was a gate there was because it was reflected on glass. And we, <coughs> needed, we needed the gate to hide the glass that we needed to reflect to bring the, it was a Pepper's Ghost illusion is what it was. Mm -hmm. So we went into a lot of details on different bits and pieces that we wanted to put in the mansion that uh, just never made it. They worked mostly in chronological order, imagining how the early rooms would function. The whole mansion would need to tell some type of story. And though they were using story ideas that had been previously developed by Ken Anderson, they didn't yet have a sense as to how the walkthrough would fit together as a narrative experience under their control. 
But they did know that there was not much point in designing later rooms if they hadn't yet fully figured out the first ones. Yeah. We got into the, uh, the library and we got into the, the uh, captain's quarters mm -hmm. uh, and where we did that. And that's, that's about as far as we got. Somebody else must have picked up the bathroom and, okay. and all of that other stuff. During these months, they got to know each other and they discovered that they each had some personal connection to the types of stories they were now arranging for the mansion. As a boy, Yale believed he had seen a ghost, an old woman who appeared to read stories, a ghost who haunted a house in ways similar to the make-believe ghost that they were now developing for this attraction. Because Yale and I would sit around you know, and I said to you one day, I said, have you ever had anything in your life that you thought was kind of supernatural? He says, oh yeah. He says, I had a, a ghost read to me when I was 10 years old. I said, what? He and his mother went back to visit relatives on the East Coast mm -hmm. and they lived in this big old house. And um, yeah, it was there the, the summer with the other, I guess they were cousins. And uh, so they were having breakfast before Yale and his mom were to come home. And uh, the mother said of the kids as well, yeah, what did you enjoy the most when you were here? And he said, the little lady that lives in the closet that reads to us every night. <laughs> and the mother said, what? And the other little kids are going, no, Yale, no, no, she'll never come back. Yale told that story and, and evidently the mother was concerned about it. And so she went to the local historical society and actually found out who the people were that built the original house and found a picture of that woman that lived there and took it and showed it to her kids. Wow. And that was it. <laughs> and so I, I just thought that, yeah, she would come out and read to the kids little little stories, and then she'd go back in the closet. And I just thought that, that's, because Yale would never make anything up. He was about as straight as they came. And Rowley, of course, had his own experience, not with ghosts, but with a psychic, someone not so different from the medium that they were then considering adding to the mansion. Rowley was curious about his future. At the moment, he was the least senior artist at WED, and though he was having a fabulous time, he was essentially working as Yale's assistant, and he was interested if maybe something more might be in his future. And, uh, and I had a uh, psychic that I used to go to in Santa Monica, and I went to the psychic because did, WED wasn't keeping me that busy. It was after we did the you know, it was, it was that interim time frame. Mm -hmm. And I and I wanted to be kept busy. I had a lot of energy. And so I went to her and I said, what do you what do you see for me? She says, well, in about a year, a year and a couple of months, she says, you're going to have 30 people working for you. And you're going to be designing like you've never designed before in your life. And she says, and I see all this color in the ceiling. To Rowley, this seemed mostly like flattery, that he'd be a supervisor and that there would be unusual bits of color hovering above his head. If he was curious about his immediate future, he would find out soon enough. Effects for the mansion were moving forward reasonably quickly, but the overall story for the attraction was stalling out. Yale and Rowley did, however, have a good time with those effects. Back when he'd been an animator, Rowley had played tricks on other artists. But now that he was at WED, on the second story of the animation building and far from the other WED artists, he had no one on whom to focus his devilish energy. So Rowley and Yale decided instead to play tricks on the janitors. We had all these skull, we had we closed all, all the way, this was at the studio on, on the second floor. We closed off all the windows with, with uh, black curtains because we were working with black light. You know, we had skulls up there, and, we, and then Yale and I had developed this monster that Walt could shoot with an infrared gun and he'd blow up. The head would come off and he was on a string, and then his uh, arms would come out and fall off. I mean, we had this whole thing rigged. And then I also had a, a, a china silk ghost on a squirrel's cage fan that would come up and and shimmer and stuff. And we were going to use that with Pepper's Ghost. See, off stage with Pepper's Ghost, if you saw something like that, it'd be pretty good. So we had it all set up, and then the janitors told personnel they didn't want to come in there work at nights. You know, and they're very superstitious. And so we said, oh, okay. So then we rigged the room. 
<laughs> and uh, what it was was that when you came in at night, there was a light in there, a small glimmer, glimmer and light. But then when you got to the middle of the room, you broke the infrared beam, and the lights went out, and the black lights came on, and the head blows off, and the guy blows off, the head comes off, the ghost comes up and shimmers, and we came back to work the next morning, and the ghosts have been shimmering all night long, and the head's hanging from the ceiling, and right in the middle of the floor is a broom. And they called us and said, they're never coming back. You have to clean up your office from now on. <laughs> but you know what it was? It was all based on how we grew up in animation. Mm -hmm. You had to have a sense of humor. You had to play games. You just had to have a. You just had to have fun. Repeatedly, as the mansion was being designed, Yale and Rolly were called away from the project to focus on other things. One of the first big projects that Rolly oversaw was a redesign of the Adventureland Bazaar at Disneyland. For the past six years, the bazaar had been a dark shop at the entrance to Adventureland, a space that wasn't particularly inviting and therefore didn't sell much. Rolly was given a budget and a very tight timeline, just six weeks to redo the entire space. It was Rolly's first opportunity to be a full art director, to visually design a space, but it was also clear that Dick Irvine was skeptical that Rolly would be able to meet the deadline and the budget. What happened was, I was called on in one day when we were redoing Adventureland, and this mm -hmm. was, uh, I think this is before the Tiki Room, mm -hmm. and, Irv and Irvine says, we want you to do the interior design for the bazaar, because mm -hmm. you got six weeks. No working drawings, no models, nothing, mm -hmm. just six weeks. Luckily, I had Jack Olson, who was the head of merchandise at Disneyland at that time. So Jack and I were good friends, and so I said, Jack, you got to help me. Well, they gave me six carpenters, six painters, and rented a space in Allied Studios at a soundstage and said, go do it. Jack Olson turned out to be the key to solving the budget problem. As he worked at Disneyland, Jack knew about a storage area backstage, casually called the Boneyard, where engineers and maintenance people left old displays, extra ticket booths, discarded decorations, and other things. These, Rolly believed, with some tools and paint, could be remade into treasures from India or perhaps Egypt. But there was no way to solve the other problem other than to devote himself to the project night and day and through every weekend to finish on time. I worked seven days a week for six weeks in my little Volkswagen, running back and forth, buying stuff downtown, you know. So I put this whole thing together from scratch in my head. I did all the layouts for the patterns. I had books that I did on it and everything. And... I was having a ball. It was, you know, the carpenters were doing whatever I asked. And one of the cutest stories is I, I would lay out a little room where the, it was a, a change room to where the girls could go in there and change and try stuff on. And so when I laid it out and I had it drawn up, one of the carpenters says, what's the scale? I said, scale? I didn't have a clue what scale was. <laughs> and so he said, well, no, don't you, a scale ruler. And I said, a scale ruler? So he finally sat there and explained to me. So I said, well, but I know that they're eight feet tall and they're four feet wide. So I made a cardboard ruler to my scale that would fit that so he had something to work with. So my ruler, one inch and three quarters of an eighth or something, <laughs> became a foot. So we did that whole thing. And Irvine had given me a date that it has to be mm -hmm. delivered to Disneyland. And I said, okay. So every Friday night I'd go back up to uh, the office on, at WED and bring him up to date on where we were and everything. And so I had it all finished, but he had lied to me about the date because he didn't think I'd make it on time. <laughs> so he, uh, luckily, one of the fellows at the studio I was working with, a real close friend of mine, said, he says, the date that he gave you is bogus. He says, it's a week later than that. I said, it is? And he said, yeah. So what happened was, I went into the office on that Friday afternoon because we were going to ship it uh, on Saturday, and we were going to ship it Saturday afternoon and get down there at around midnight and unload it at midnight so it would be there on uh, Sunday morning. The electricians would come in on Monday and Tuesday, and it would be ready for opening on Wednesday. Of course, it wasn't that Wednesday. It was the following mm -hmm. Wednesday. So I bring it all in. Of course, now... Dick is just shitting there. I mean, he's thinking, oh my God. 
This is now a problem because Dick Irvine, who is the director of WED, has already arranged for the electricians and the rest of the installation crew to be at Disneyland the following week to receive the shipment. So now Irvine either needs to undo his installation plans or admit to Rolly that he lied to him because he didn't believe that Rolly could complete the project on time. He's, you know, so he had to call Joe Fowler. I said, Joe, uh, Rolly's here and we're shipping. Saturday, we're shipping everything down for the bazaar. Yeah, I know, Joe. Yeah, I, yeah, I know, Joe. It's, uh, you know, but we've got to do that, you know, because Joe's saying, wait a minute, that's not the day. And, and Dick said, because Dick doesn't want to be caught. So they had to work <laughs> two nights in a row all night long to put the floor in. The floor wasn't even in yet. So these are the, some of the things that contributed to uh, Dick Irvine and Rolly Crump's uh, time <laughs> together. So Dick Irvine's plan was that he was going to appear magnanimous when he gave you an extra week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, well, what he told me finally was, well, they changed it because of something else. There was a reason that they changed it. It was because of something else. But uh, even though Rolly wasn't physically working on the mansion during these months, he still thought about it. And the following summer, he had a small breakthrough in terms of how the overall attraction layout might work, specifically how they might move very large groups of people through the mansion as a walking tour. The reason that he sent us up to Seattle and to the different world's fairs he said, you go out there and see what the other people are doing. He said, you, and you'll be surprised. You'll bring something back that'll help us. Mm -hmm. So he wanted people to expand. He wanted people to grow. He didn't want them to just, you know, just sit there. The World's Fair that year was in Seattle. Though Disney did often create film or amusement attractions for World's Fairs, he didn't have anything in Seattle. Still, he knew that the fair would be the place where other companies would showcase some of their most imaginative works. Because of this, he insisted that many key people from WED spend time there. And you know where we got the idea was when we went to the World's Fair up in Seattle. Oh, 62. And they had, a, you know, we all went up there. Walt sent us up to see what was going on. And there was this elevator in this one building. You got in the elevator and you went up into the ceiling and the elevator came down and nobody was in it. And you wondered, <laughs> where the hell did they go? Well, what happened was that when you got up to the top, you were released and you're in a big black hallway. And then down at the end of the hallway was a television screen. And there's a guy on the screen saying, come on down here, come on down here. So we all walked down there. So we actually were walked through this exhibit by just turning out the lights where you were and lighting lights up over here. So that's what gave us, gave Yale and I the idea that that's the way you'd move people through the Haunted Mansion. And the elevator was designed to hold exactly 100 people. That was what, every, what it was supposed to be. Every three minutes you moved 100 people from, from one area to another. Rowley took this idea back to Glendale and discussed it with Walt. It was a way to partially mechanize a walkthrough tour. Part of the problem at this point had been the belief that it would take too many operations people to manage a large walkthrough mansion. Simply put, the labor cost would be too expensive. But here, Rowley saw a way to at least partially automate the tour by guiding guests forward with a series of lights. But they were moving it by just turning on the lights and turning off the lights. When they turned off the lights, it was time for you to move, and there was another light that came on when these lights went on. So it was almost like you were pulsing people beautifully, very simply, with just lights going on and lights going off. And so that basically uh, became sort of the thread of how to move people through the Haunted Mansion that was a walkthrough. And Walt liked that. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he always wanted it as a walkthrough. He never never ever discuss it being a ride. But 1962 was not the right time for Wed to jump back into the mansion. There were other big things in the works, even if one of the most complex attractions started out as something small. Uh, Dick Irvine came in to me one day and he said, Walt wants a tea room on Main Street. He said, would you design a tea room? I said, yeah. So I started developing a, a tea room that had all these clocks in it 
One of them was a Kalepistra, which is the water clock, you know, that came out of Greece and everything. So while I'm working on that, then Yale, I mean, uh, uh, Irvine comes in and says, well, Raleigh, no, wait a while. We've decided not to make a tea room, but we're going to do a little restaurant in Adventureland. Mm -hmm. And he says, a Tahitian restaurant. And I said, oh, okay. So he said, we've got to work on that. So the very, uh, I guess what happened was um, he, Irvine went to Hinch, and I have the photograph of the original drawing that Hinch did, and said, John, would you do an illustration of what a Tahitian restaurant would look like? So John said, yeah. So he came in. So we had our first meeting with Walt on the on the, what was eventually the Tiki Room, which was nothing more than a Tahitian restaurant. And in there were all these birds and cages and stuff. And Walt said to John, he said, you did this, Johnny? He called him Johnny, which was kind of cute. <laughs> Johnny, you did this? And, oh, yeah. And he said, well, you know, you can't have birds in here, John. And, and, and John says, why not? He said, because they'll poop in the food. That's a true story. And and John says, no, 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 Walt. He said, they're stuffed birds. And, and, and Walt said, stuffed birds? He said, Disney doesn't stuff birds. And John said, no, no, no. Uh, they, they're not, they look like they might be stuffed, but really they're little mechanical birds. And he says, in fact, they kind of go tweet. And then somebody else said, well, uh, we could have birds at each end kind of going tweet, tweet. And that was the first meeting that we ever had Mm -hmm. on the Tiki Room. And that's how it all got started. And then all of a sudden we all got assignments. Uh, I got the assignment to design the pre-show Tiki's. But aside from the most general image of a statue at a Tiki bar, Roly had no idea as to what Polynesian gods and goddesses might look like. So he did two things at the same time. He began to design his first tiki while he also looked for a book to inspire him toward more authentic creations. I got a book out of UCLA called The Whispers on the Wind, which was the missionaries wrote a book. Let me pause here for a second. It took me forever to find this book because the title that Rolly is using, Whispers on the Wind, is actually a far better title than the one the book actually has. If you want to go looking for this book, you should look for Voices on the Wind. So I took that and developed all of these tikis from those legends and that's why they each have a name and it's related to that book. And uh, I did all of those as authentic tikis, except one of them, which was really funny. There was one tiki uh, style that I got out of the Sepik River. And what it was was a tiki standing there, but his weenie was laying on the top of a, of a little head between his legs. I found out later that was his wife. And supposedly that showed that the man was over with the women, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I started to do that one. And yes, this does sound a little like a fertility god with some oversized genitalia strapped to the tiki god's head. But this didn't worry Roly too much. After all, he had already posted homemade beatnik posters for hard drugs as part of his art show in the Disney Studio Library. He thought if he disguised this fertility god a little, it would probably turn out okay do a drawing on that and Hitch says, you can't. Disneyland's not going to allow you to have a, a weenie on a head of somebody. So I says, okay, fine. So I decided to use the old Japanese trick where you spin, spit water into a, a, a little bamboo and when it fills, it dumps and when it comes back, it hits a leg. Well, those are to scare the, um, the deer and the rabbits away in the vegetable gardens. Mm -hmm. So I made that little guy, but I made him from, you know, the original one and I never... Had, an, had a name for him. And so Walt said, Roland, he said, are these all authentic uh, gods and tiki? So I said, oh, yes, sir, they are. And, and he pointed to that one, which wasn't. And he said, what's that the god of? It? Well, Hench came to my saving and said, well, that's a, the god of Tampa cloth beating. And he said it kind of quick, and Walt didn't quite understand what he said when he said Tampa cloth beating. He says, what kind of a clock? And John says, it's a god that tells the time. And oh, Walt said, okay, fine. <laughs> so after the meeting, John says, you better find out who the hell the god is that tells the time, which I did, and it turns out to be Maui. But that's, those are what we call the happy accidents. <laughs> you know, it's a slip of the lip, and all of a sudden you come up with something. Wow. But the next time you're at Disneyland, make sure to take a look at Maui in the pre-show area of the Tiki Room, because... 
Now that you know the story, it's pretty easy to see this early influence. This, of course, is no longer the presentation of a fertility god, but you can see that some of the elements there are a light adaptation of that influence. And that right there, I believe, is one of the sly legacies of one of the most free-thinking artists at WED. But once all those tikis for the pre-show were signed off by Walt, Walt put Rolly to work on the show itself. Walt said to me, and when he says, I want a birdmobile, he loved mer this idea of mobiles. He said, I want a birdmobile coming out of the city with a hundred birds on it. I said, okay. I said, okay to anything he asked for. Well, he, when he went over to the machine shop and asked him to do it, by the time they designed a, a, something that would come out of the ceiling and open up, the, the space in there would only hold, because they were all air-driven birds, but only hold so many lines. So instead of 100, it was 30. <laughs> but uh, so the, the birdmobile then became what it was. And then I had to sculpt it. I was up on a Raymond lift for three weeks sculpting this damn bird, uh, out, you know, this thing coming out mm -hmm. of the ceiling and did that. And then meanwhile, I was doing the uh, tiki's that were in the pre-show. By doing them, Rolly means that the tiki's now needed to be sculpted at scale with plasticine, and then the studio made molds from them to cast the final figures as fiberglass. Figures that would be incredibly durable at the park and hold up to the strong California sun. And we all started sculpting. I mean, I had never sculpted before in my life. And when they asked me to sculpt the tiki's because I went to Blaine, I said, here, that Walt bought off on these tiki's. He said, um, I said, you know, we've got to, you've got to sculpt them. And Blaine says, I don't have time. I said, what do you mean you don't have time? He says, I said, who's going to do it? He said, you are. And I said, I've never sculpted before. He said, you're going to be in it. So then the first piece of sculpture I ever did is in Disneyland. It's Maui spitting the water into the bamboo and wow. dumping it. But from the tiki room, Rowley absorbed one more idea, an observation that ate away at his imagination. The Tiki Room, a musical comedy, presented the god spirits of the islands who made the entire Tiki Room come to life. The walls began to move and sculptures began to pound drums. These were gods of mischief and comedy, but Rowley started to sense that some of the narrative moves here in the Tiki Room could be repurposed for the Haunted Mansion. Walls and doors that might come to life along with the furniture. And instead of having spirits of whimsy, darker spirits in the mansion might point to the shortcomings and fears of mankind in general. That is, up until this point, at least in Yale and Rowley's designs for the mansion, the mansion had largely been focused on ghosts of the dead. But the Tiki Room subtly suggested that there might be other types of hauntings, spirits who came from beyond the world of humans and who had a message for humanity, and rooms and objects that came to life. Though, of course, these hauntings would need to have far gloomier emotional tones rather than the musical playfulness of the Tiki Room if they were to be included in the mansion. It was just something he was starting to picture, something he couldn't yet see. See, what happened was Walt was never happy with what the, Han the animation, I mean, what the uh, Haunted Mansion was. And the last, um, in fact, it's interesting, the last meeting that we had with Walt on it was the day that I introduced the Museum of the Weird. And then after that, uh, we, he put a hold on it because we were going to work on the World's Fair. Okay. So it was put on hold because of the World's Fair. And uh, then when we came back, we were going to get back on it again. At this point, Walt had three attractions at the New York World's Fair for 1964. They were all sponsored by outside groups, which allowed engineers at WED to develop new technology with the bills largely paid for by outside organizations. During this period, that is, right after the opening of the Tiki Room, very little was developed for Disneyland, even though, since its opening, Disneyland had enjoyed a new ride or attraction each and every year, and many years they enjoyed multiple new rides added to the park. This period was also useful for Rolly because it allowed his mind to quietly percolate on what he'd seen, 
to reconsider how those very traditional plans for the haunted mansion might evolve into something else. The first World's Fair assignment he was given was for the Ford Pavilion. Other artists had already designed the ride in which guests, riding in actual Ford cars, would witness the evolution and future of transportation. The ride would begin with early humans, animatronic cave people who, at least in this version of history, created the first wheel and then the first cart and then, rather comically, began the multi-millennial movement that would lead eventually to the automobile. It was an inventive, comedic ride that was sure to bring in a big audience. But as the fair attracted massive crowds, Walt believed that guests there should also have something interesting to see while waiting in line. So it was funny because Walt came to me and says, I, he says, when people are standing in line to go on that ride, he says, I want to entertain a role. He says, I want you to build a little orchestra for me. So I did a whole bunch of sketches uh, different little orchestras. They were kind of abstract, funny little things. And I think it was Walt said to me, he said, Rolly, why don't you do uh, an orchestra out of automobile parts? So then that's when I got Gurr. Gurr and I sat down and we got all these uh, books on parts, on car parts. We got them out and I got the scale of them and everything. So I would do little sketches of how you'd make a trumpet. And one of them was you took an axle and you cut it and made it axle this long and then you took a carburetor it was a, yeah it was a carburetor and you welded a carburetor on it then you took a uh, a pulley that that runs a fan belt and welded on the end and by the time you got finished with it the silhouette looked like a trumpet and so that bob and i worked side by side on that and the hubcaps were the symbols you know <laughs> and uh, so we actually developed um these, these out of car parts, and then I made, built a model on it. I've actually have a photograph of me working on this little model, and then I've actually got photographs of people walking by it at the World's Fair. The Automotive Orchestra was a fanciful addition to the Ford Pavilion, something to capture the imagination of guests as they waited in line to step into a Ford car, one that was affixed to a track system, and roll back in history to see dinosaurs and cave people. It was a period of intense work at WED. The Ford attraction by itself was far larger than any single ride that then existed at Disneyland. But Rolly being Rolly still found ways to have a good time while at work with one of his favorite stories involving one of those animatronic cave women recently cast and painted by WED lead sculptor, Blaine Gibson. One of the best stories, and I don't know, you heard about about with me and the uh, cave woman. This was uh, Blaine said, Rolly, we, he, they, they carved her, sent her to the studio, they made a fiberglass body for her, and then they put the skin on her, then they put a vicuna around her, big fur. They brought her back and they had her in the model shop, and Blaine said, Rolly, I like the color of the skin, but I don't know whether it's really the right value for a human being. So he said, would you mind taking your shirt off and standing right next to her and let me shoot you with a Polaroid camera in black and white? And I said, fine. So I said, I'll do better than that. I took my shirt off, I took my shoes off, I rolled my pants up and I put a vicuna around me and I just had a good time with her. I mean, she was pretty well endowed. So really, basically, there was probably about 15 black and white Polaroid shot of Rolly attacking this cave woman. Mm -hmm. and, and Blaine looked at it and says, you know, Rolly, says, the value is perfect. I like the color. It worked out fine. So he put it in his little file. <laughs> well, what happened was, Walt came over a couple of weeks later and was asking Blaine about something. And Blaine said, well, I've got that in my file. So Blaine's going through the file, and all of a sudden, Walt sees Rolly attacking this cave woman. And I'm standing there, and Walt says, what's that? And he says, well, we were just checking skin value. And Walt said, let me see those. And I thought, oh, Jesus Christ. So they pulled them out, and they laid them out on the counter. And, and Walt's busting out laughing. Uh -huh. Well, meanwhile, I head over to get a 7-Up to calm myself down. Mm -hmm. I'm at the 7-Up machine, and Malcolm Cobb, this close friend of mine, comes. I said, what's going on? And I said, well, Walt's over there, and he's seeing the, me where I'm attacking that cave woman. And this friend of mine said, well, what did he say? And I said, he laughed. And I turned around, Walt was right there and he looked at me and smiled and said, that's right, Rolly, he laughed. And then he bought himself a 7-Up. <laughs>
So, I mean, this, this, this was the thing that was kind of the, the thread of spark of life that we had mm -hmm. that carried on. It was all based on growing up in animation. You never would have had it. And in fact, there was a lot of people that never uh, got involved with having fun like that. Mark Davis never did. None of the guys, none of the 90 men ever did. And, and a lot of the other ones, you just had to do it yourself and have some fun. And this right here brings us up to 1963, a high point of wet activity, a period in which Walt was expanding his designs into new markets. It was also a period in which Rowley was about to embark on designs that would forever define his career, projects that one day would be synonymous with his name. I'll be back next week with a new episode. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. You can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes, but the best reason to join is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly Bandcamp subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until then, this is Todd James Pierce.